Hello, am I neurodivergent chapter 31? I'm Strun, late diagnosed ODHD, which is autism and ADHD combined. Uh, these videos are a week by week recap of my neurodivergent discovery year, trying to understand the, the new me, or the me that always was, but um, I just hadn't realised. Last week I started doing a kind of my two stories, my two narratives of my childhood, the happy rose-tinted external version and the retrospective dude you were actually kind of struggling internal version, both of which I described as being equally true. So seven months into my discovery year after self-diagnosing as autistic, four months after a formal ASD diagnosis, summer 2022, I was going through my life kind of sequentially with a really lovely NHS psychiatrist at this point and trying to resolve these two narratives and how and if they fit together, both the external, slightly embarrassed and apologetic, but I was really happy and successful before my stress breakdown and I don't really know why it happened, let's just move on and put it behind me narrative. And the, I've actually been miserably unhappy for years and on a one-way ticket to a breakdown as a result of neurodivergent masking narrative, um, both of which were true, like I said. Um, both of those narratives were differently right. And yeah, this process I was going through at this point in my discovery year was trying to weave those two narratives together in one coherent one um, I could move forward with and one I could feel a bit more in harmony with myself. So yeah, childhood last week, this week I'm going to basically go through the same process with my teens. Right, my happy rose-tinted teenager story first, my, my happy teens. Um, I finished in my last video, my childhood one, that at the end of primary school I somehow passed the entrance exam to get into one of the top private schools in, uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland. I started um, a school called George Harriet's in Edinburgh. I did pretty well academically. I was in the second top class, even though I was rarely fully captivated by the academic work. Um, I loved history, particularly like ancient Egypt, religious history, World War II. But broadly, I was much more into my various nerdy hobbies like Star Trek The Next Generation, obsessive comic book collecting, gaming, WWF wrestling, and later in my teens, films and literature and indie music. But early doors, I was very much continuing from my childhood and early teens, being a basically pretty contented little dork living in in my own little world. I became obsessed with the history of American comics and categorizing them and knowing everything about them. I had my comics in clear plastic wallets and, and blue tacked a ton of them to my wall for this ever evolving ranking system that made sense in my head if no one else's. Um, I later had the same obsession with the history of rock music. My initial love for 90s indie and grunge and NME bands like James and R.E.M. and Nirvana, moving into 60s classic rock albums as I learned all their influences like Beatles, Dylan, Stones, Birds, Beach Boys and ranking and displaying album sleeves on my wall. The Doors and Jim Morrison in particular became a bit of an obsession and um, it's hilarious looking back at all the kind of artists I got a bit fixated on as a teen like Jim Morrison and Bob Dylan routinely come up now as folk that people think were or are almost certainly on the spectrum. Uh, David Lynch, as a filmmaker, exactly the same thing. I loved reruns of Twin Peaks. Uh, Lynch and Twin Peaks became another hyper fixation and obsessed with it. Researching fan theories on, on what it was all really about um, at Edinburgh's first internet cafe. Um, being a teenager when the internet kind of first became a thing was cool, just information at your fingertips from, from anywhere. Um, I loved an enigma to try to solve, and Twin Peaks with its supernatural, sinister, otherworldly weirdness from the recesses of David Lynch's brain, it kept me very occupied um, and spiralled me off into all sorts of other esoteric learning. Uh, kind of working out something bizarre to find the hidden meaning behind all the symbolism and 
Deciphering hidden meanings are likely why so many autistic people can sometimes get into ridiculous conspiracy theories and can get themselves, ourselves, a bit tied up in knots, um, by the way, but that is another story for another day. More prosaically, as a teen, I joined the Navy cadets at school. Um, I think the routine and discipline and hierarchy appealed to the Star Trek fan in me. Um, I learned to ski. I got quite fascinated with politics, both nationally and globally. Um, my high school modern studies class really sparked this. We looked at the theory and history and competing philosophies of the Tory and Labour parties in the UK. Um, my initial interest immediately fell towards the third party, the traditional middle ground laughing stock of British politics, the, the Liberal Democrats, who to me were the obvious answer to these competing political ideologies. They were all about balance and striking a pragmatic compromise between the two more extreme viewpoints. Um, I think it was that autistic system thinking kicking in. Even back then when I was um, developing this real interest in finding the the quote-unquote right answer to apparently intractable problems. Um, and to my schoolboy brain, the Liberal Democrats seemed like the, the right answer to divided British politics. That pragmatism was the only... <clears throat> it's kind of that Hegelian dialectic I got more into when I got into philosophy, like thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Um, 20 years on, I think it's safe to say the Lib Dems were not the answer to, to British politics. Um, they could have been, but you alienated that student vote, Clegg. You didn't know that children were the future. And lo, British politics would remain divided and tribal and mired in nonsense for a whole further generation. God rest your soul, Charlie Kennedy. Our nation turned its lonely eyes to you. Um, sorry, this is supposed to be the happy primary colour scrapbook version of my teens and the 90s. Why am I talking about Charles Kennedy and Nick Clegg? Um, global politics as a teen. Absolutely fell in love with the concept of and learning about the United Nations in both history and modern studies classes. It seemed the closest thing we had on Earth to Star Trek's United Federation of Planets to me, and I set my heart on working for the UN from my early teens. Um, I did almost end up working for the UN in my 30s, but um, that'll be for a couple of weeks' time. What else? <clears throat> Got interested in girls, worked a Saturday job at the family sports shop, went on holidays with friends, learned to drive, got my first girlfriend, went to the pub for the first time, um, underage and with a fake ID, naturally, Scottish tradition. Um, got quite into poetry and creative writing. I really enjoyed kind of whimsical, poetic literature. Um, Louise Erdrich and George Mackay Brown were, were two favourites. I started writing poetry. I even got a couple of naff teenage poems published, if I remember correctly. I was basically trying to find myself and who I was, like all teenagers do, um, whatever your neurotype. I had this cheesy poster of the um, the Native American commandments in my room. Um, not a thing, obviously. Um, but this was the 90s. Um, now, pretty blatant cultural appropriation. But, like, treat the earth and all that dwell thereon with respect. Um, work together for the benefit of all mankind. Do what you know to be right. Look after the well-being of mind and body. This was some of them. I'm just trying to think about what it means to live well and with a moral compass, I guess. I looked into joining Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. Um, I didn't because ADHD. Um, I couldn't decide where to go to university or what to study, so I went on a gap year school exchange program to America, to a high school in, in South Carolina. Made new friends, smoked my first joint, came home, got into St Andrews University, Again, one of the country's top unis, and um, took a whole bunch of courses trying to work out what to major in. So, like English literature, philosophy, ancient history, social anthropology. Made more friends there. Was devouring, quote unquote, um, meaningful books and poems. Um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, Sophie's World, The Wasteland um, were kind of long term favourites from this period. Um, I acted in my first play. I was in Death of a Salesman. 
drank lots of wine and just sort of stayed up late talking shit with other pretentious teenagers. Um, got good grades for my essays, rebelled a bit, got my ear pierced, um, worked holidays at Blockbuster Video um, after my dad's shop closed down. Uh, Blockbuster Video was probably the best job I ever had. Um, and got a gig reviewing music and films for the university and student newspaper. Um, actually, maybe that was the best job I ever had. Um, so yeah, again, much like my childhood, pretty normal, privileged, happy, fortunate teenage experience, uh, right? Tick, done, nailed my teens, 20s beckon. Um, okay, so same as last time, now my kind of dissonant teens. Um, same external experiences, but with some of the escalating inner turmoil of being undiagnosed autistic and ADHD that um, seem clear as day now, um, and we're building the foundations of what would become at times quite an unhappy, desperate adulthood. Um, but I just had no idea where anything exceptional to the norm back then, and also how the kind of autistic traits and ADHD traits I now know I have kind of waxed and waned and shadowed and challenged each other over the years. Um, so when I started at secondary school, I actually quite enjoyed it when I first started and the change didn't seem to affect me that badly. Um, and that was actually one of the things the psychiatrist actually agreed was likely my ADHD tempering my autism. At times, I'm very intensely in need of routine and sameness, but at other times I crave and enjoy change. It's, yeah, like I said, that ADHD ebb and flow of the two conditions kind of shadowing and fighting each other. My first day at secondary school, though, was utterly miserable, and as well as having to wear a uniform and blazer and tie, again, the the finding all the new people and buildings and noises and classes was pretty overwhelming. Um, the school was in the city centre, we lived in the suburbs, and now I had to get the bus home. So off I trotted to the, the bus stop, 11 years old, sat upstairs with a couple of comics to read. Um, bus goes past a normal non-private secondary school, uh, other kids pour upstairs on the bus. Of course the kid in the school uniform from a different school reading Batman or X-Men or whatever, um, gets the piss taken out of him, shoved around, laughed at, spat on, called posh boy. I think because I was often quite away in my own little world, I kind of assumed I was invisible and just kind of floating through life, observing it but not really interacting with it. And things like this, where people noticed me and were kind of hostile, were incredibly jarring. And, and when I realised not only am I not invisible, but for whatever reason, I could be a kind of figure of fun to others for reasons I didn't really get, or maybe that I didn't respond to teasing in the right way, and then that escalates. I don't know, really. I, I really hated standing out and feeling noticed from that moment on. I know that in a way I hadn't really in primary school. I started going home a longer way to avoid being noticed and almost tried to make myself more invisible and unnoticeable at times to avoid attention, to kind of blend into the background. Um, stuff like this from the beginning of my teens just made me double down on wanting to withdraw from the wider world. And, um, and those feelings, that kind of tension between wanting to... Like... Like I mentioned last time that my granddad told me as a kid, um, striving to leave the world a better place than you found it, but on the flip side, just wanting to have as little to do with the outside world as I could. Those two competing wants and needs have really wrestled inside me ever since my teens, and again, kind of waxed and waned over the, the years with um, which contradictory pull I've given precedence to at, at any given time. Um, my actual schoolwork and making the transition from primary to secondary school. Like I said, I was, I was broadly speaking far more interested in my comics than schoolwork. When something interested me, I could hyper-focus on it and do well. But most of the schoolwork just didn't interest me, um, particularly maths, um, defying autistic stereotypes. We are not all maths geniuses. Um, 
I think it was because much of it was so out of context. I needed to understand the wider context of why we were learning something. And that context was so often lacking. When there's no context for something, I find it very difficult to sustain interest in it. I'd stay, I'd stay up super late to do my homework because I'd always read comics and play computer games first and put off the homework, but like all teenagers do that, I guess. I do remember that having to do homework, it was a big, it was a big change from primary school um, and it did start to make me more and more stressed as time went by but I found it harder and harder to just get it done and would put it off and off until after everyone had gone to bed and then stay up late doing it when there were no other distractions because I felt like I had to really, really concentrate on it with zero distractions. Um, my mum had been a teacher um, and that really helped me out. And even if I was, um, even if I was already starting to hide just how much I was struggling, to know how to start school work. Um, she helped me a lot at the start of secondary school um, with things like getting started on like geography and history projects and understanding what would be expected of me by teachers and kind of showing me the way to get started, which was a massive help. I think oftentimes I just don't really understand what's expected of me. Like if there's no clear model to follow, so I just don't start things and disengage with them completely. But once I've been shown what to do and I get it, I quite often seemed able to kind of ace it and almost do it better than average and, and be able to focus just long enough to do well and get good grades. But yeah, I was broadly more interested at the start there in, in kind of making my own Marvel comics weekly review magazine that I'd um, type up in my little manual typewriter on folded over A3 paper and then I would sew the pages together on my mum's sewing machine and have these little weekly publications for myself making sense of all the comics that came out each week and how I rated them, rated the story, rated the artwork, distributed my reviews to an audience of one but I was absolutely delighted with it. So my target audience like had a 100% satisfaction rating, at least. And um, these little projects were quite often the entirety of my focus with um, schoolwork occasionally interrupting whatever I was actually interested in. This kind of cycle of engaging and then disengaging with the outside world. Um, I mentioned I briefly joined the Navy cadets at school and um, basically because it was sort of like Star Trek, which I was really into. And I even briefly considered going into the military because it had this sort of understandable structure. We had this weekend away where all the cadets went and stayed on an army base um, for like shooting practice and drills and things that I absolutely hated, um, but channeled being like both Data and Spock, and um, they were always my favorites from Star Trek, and was just like, Fascinating behavior, observe, repeat, integrate, thrive. And um, they did this exercise where all the cadets were put into camouflage gear with fake guns and had mud smeared over us. And we were sent out into huge forest and moorland area to, to hide. Um, we had half an hour to hide and then actual soldiers would come and look for us. So I just ran and ran and ran with my little fake gun until I was nowhere near any of the other cadets and kind of kind of buried myself between leaves and a bush. And I stayed there for hours and hours until it eventually got really dark. And I was like, screw this, I'm really cold and wet. I'm going back to the base. I don't care if I've lost the game. And like everyone else was already in the mess hall. Um, and they were just like, yeah, the exercise finished hours ago. I wasn't even missed. Um, I might be useless at a lot of stuff, but my uh, brief time as a Navy cadet uh, taught me that I'm fucking good at running away and hiding, if nothing else. Um, I left the cadets altogether not long after that. It was it was not the career path for me. Um, my trichotillomania was pretty bad around this time, I remember. Um, I had quite a lot of anxiety, which I just internalised. Um, hair, you're a teenager, hair is growing in kind of weird new places, and I would try and pull it out. I really don't know whether that was an artistic resistance to change or just because my thoughts felt so fragmented and out of control as a, as a regular teenager, um, but not all teenagers 
pulled her own body hair out, I guess. Um, we also had school exams in all subjects for the first time, and <clears throat> I could not make myself study for them. I just didn't know how to start a revision program, or hadn't listened properly at school, um, if they told us. And I remember I went off school sick for quite a bit around this time. It was clearly stress and anxiety in retrospect, but that language was just not a thing for kids in the 90s. Um, I was just home because I didn't feel well for whatever reason. Um, I unashamedly say that I had watched Ferris Bueller and treated it as an instructive documentary, like licking my palms for clamminess and affecting a shortness of breath, except I didn't go out and have adventures like Ferris when I stayed home. I just stayed in bed and agonised about the point of life, like Cameron. Um, this was another thing. When I first got my ASD diagnosis, one of the things you read is, autistic people are honest to a fault and generally don't or can't lie or fib. And I was like, hmm, okay. Um, hello again, imposter syndrome. Um, maybe I'm not autistic, um, but yeah, the, the co-occurring ADHD, you're constantly like, what stories can I make up to get out of A, B, and C? Um, but the integrity bit of you feels like absolute shit about doing so. It's that internal ADHD war again. Um, with secondary school, where am I? My coursework was broadly fine. Um, it was exams and revising in this very structured, rigid way to pass them that I couldn't deal with and, and had some kind of weird demand avoidance or procrastination, um, which gave me massive anxiety from my teens and onwards. But it was the it was the lack of consistency with my performance that baffled and frustrated my teachers. I think they couldn't put me into an easily explained box. Um, in my third year of secondary school, so around thirteen fourteen, we studied Lord of the Flies by uh, William Golding, and it massively appealed to me in in ways that other kind of core English texts hadn't. The discussions of how close civilized society is always teetering on the edge of savagery. It, it both absolutely fascinated and terrified me and, and prompted loads of thoughts. Um, and I wrote this essay linking into concepts of morality and philosophy that I picked up from either my comics or Star Trek novels um, that my English teacher refused to believe I hadn't plagiarized, which I think it was an accusation I think both offended and delighted me. Um, so I got, I got carpeted by the teacher after class and uh, confession of cheating was uh, demanded. Um, I talked last time about the American 2E profile and how bright kids who are also neurodivergent can basically have their strengths and challenges crash into each other to basically appear average. And um, this had basically happened to me pretty quickly at secondary school. My year group was like triple or quadruple the size it had been in primary school. So I just didn't stand out. Um, it was also a pretty good school, so there were plenty of other bright kids and bright kids who could actually do work. And this English class was one of the first times I'd been kind of engaged and interested enough to turn my full attention to exploring themes and trying to push my own thinking in line with what the teachers were wanting us to think about, if that makes sense. Be because I think I'd been seen as a fairly average academic performer before then, um, they just did not believe I'd written this insightful essay out of nowhere. Um, so to kind of prove a point, I kept firing in these good essays uh, after that and started getting noticed and encouraged more academically and started getting good grades for, for English. It's, it's funny, I think I thought at that time that I was finding it surprisingly easy to kind of bullshit teachers into giving me good grades just by using long words and making links and connections to unusual subjects. Um, like I'd ended up knowing quite a lot about mythology and different cultures through comics and sci-fi novels. Um, plus when I got into The Doors music and all of Jim Morrison's weird interests and influences like William Blake poetry, Aldous Huxley, Brecht and Vile, James Fraser's Golden Bough, and got into kind of learning about things like esoteric religions and occultism through all these different avenues, plus like Twin Peaks and David Lynch fan sites and just 
reading all the random music and culture articles in NME magazine with these young journalists trying to show off and be intellectual and soaking all these things up. And then me at school suddenly trying to reinterpret standard readings of books into completely different interpretations using all these touch points that I'd been soaking up. It was only years later when I was describing this kind of getting away with things academically that someone said, are you sure you were bullshitting? It sounds like you were actually just good at critical interpretation, um, which I guess in retrospect I might have been, but in my head at the time, I was definitely just bullshitting the teachers and getting away with it. Um, but I basically only started excelling academically, um, albeit briefly, to prove that I hadn't cheated or plagiarised my own work after being accused of it. I think I've always felt like a bit of a fraud or a bit of a cheat and, and I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about authenticity going back to around this time. And it's, I think it's because a big part of the reason they thought I was plagiarising my work rather than coming up with it myself was because I was utterly incapable of summarising verbally the points I'd raised in the essay when the teacher quizzed me on it. I just kind of mentally meander and can't quite remember and can't quite summarise my own points concisely. And year, years later, this would again reveal itself to just be ADHD and poor working memory recall. But because I always needed to refer to my notes to express my thoughts clearly in writing and stay on point, I always felt like a bit of a fraud, like I was a bit dumb and, and needed to kind of cheat to appear smart by making notes for things in advance so I could refer to Otherwise, I was always just a bit of a shambles mentally. Um, I didn't understand it. Teachers didn't understand it. Um, I was just I was just a frustrating kid. Um, towards the end of secondary school, I went on work experience to this advertising firm, and it was it was around this time I first noticed I really had trouble keeping up with rapid fire kind of brainstorming discussions, particularly about subjects and have a huge amount of knowledge or interest in and I just kind of switched off and disengaged when I couldn't keep up and again I'd later find out um, this is a relatively common autism thing verbal processing delays um, it's why so many of us prefer written communication to verbal communication but at, at the time this just compounded me feeling dumb and incapable and unable to keep up with even basic conversations and I like I just I didn't get myself I I plummeted down the sets for maths from the second top set to the second bottom set and then I dropped out of higher maths entirely and got placed in a remedial class with um, other kids with behavioral issues who were just really struggling with school I think the fact I appeared academically excellent at some things and thick as mints basically in others it clearly really frustrated my teachers and the you're lazy you're underachieving message i'd had at primary school right sim similar to the last video i'm just going to read out some quotes from my secondary school report cards chronologically from early high school and um, to the end and the way the system just obviously kind of crushed me over time from being a bright, chatty kid to a withdrawn, sad teenager whose, whose self-esteem had been trammeled over. I think and hope things are getting better now, but in the 90s, the UK education system, it just routinely destroyed neurodivergent kids. And it wasn't just me, either with this gripe. I've heard this from others now. Very similar stories time and time again. So from my first year report card a lively imaginative pupil who contributes well to the class an excellent start to secondary education the next year must concentrate on classwork strewn can be rather disorganized and is particularly poor at following written instructions appears interested and works with enthusiasm but he is rather disorganized in practical lessons can be silly at times as things go on works slowly and is far too easily distracted. He had clearly done insufficient revision, very poor work at this stage. His attention and interest fluctuates in class. Results are disappointing. The silly behavior in class must stop. Um, 
my form teacher during hires. I find Strom to be a very personable young man, but he has a strong tendency to be disorganised and often seems to be one step behind the rest of the world. This is not due to lack of intelligence, as is apparent if you observe Strom's conversations. And for my final year, when I just had all my remaining interest drained out of me, um, he has been rather down so far this season, rather quieter than in the past. On his cheerful, smiling days, he is both perceptive about the work and extremely amusing. Even when he is less enthusiastic, I feel he is a keen observer of what is going on. He's an, he is an intriguing, introspective young man, not easy to get to know, shy with a dash of reticence, complex with a pleasing mix of seriousness and wit, an enigmatic, thoughtful young man who has to be cajoled into smiling. Again, like primary, there was no attempt none to work out why I was good in some areas but clearly struggling in others it was just what a confounding child how strange oh well good luck bye thanks for your money and this was one of Edinburgh's top schools and um, I really hope they have better pastoral care now but I suspect they probably don't and um, that smiling thing um, um I have I ha I got it a lot as a teen. I was told at various Saturday jobs I worked at to smile more and, and be friendlier towards customers constantly. And in these bloody videos, actually. And I've always found it really, really hard to just plaster on a smile when I've not felt genuinely happy. Um, my six-year English teacher, one of the few teachers I actually liked and who seemed interested in me, once said, you're never satisfied with anything, are you? Uh, that's a good thing. Keep it. And that kind of stayed with me over the years as a bit of a comfort somehow. So there were bits of school or bits of teachers that did help me out somewhat, I guess. But anyway, yeah, that was broadly secondary school. Social skills and relationships. Crikey. Um, I had a few quote-unquote girlfriends in my early teens, but it was always very passive um, on my part. A girl would say, do you want to go out or be my boyfriend? And I would say, sure, and think, cool, a new friend. But when they weren't interested in comics or Star Trek, I kind of lost interest and didn't really know how I was supposed to act or behave. So I'd basically just ignore or avoid them and would generally get dumped a couple of weeks later for being weird. Um, I'd quite often act out and make jokes and try to be funny and take the piss out of teachers as a kind of deflective defense mechanism. I think my thinking was if I was kind of the class joker and slightly naughty and arch, then people wouldn't bully or pick on me, I guess. And I think some of my contributions in class were maybe a bit more interesting or random than others. And girls would sometimes try to get to know me better and hang out, which was great to kind of chat to but anytime it would be like kind of formal or going on a date or going to the cinema together I would just kind of panic and go from this is nice to that I, I suddenly became aware there were certain things you were supposed to do or social cues or whatever and just feel awkward and suddenly not like being in that situation anymore so try to leave and um, again just feeling a bit weird and then leaving um, weird on a date and not a positive quality, it turns out. Um, also, this was the 90s and um, you were... It was before mobile phones, before cell phones. Um, and if you had a quote-unquote girlfriend, you, you were supposed to speak to them on the phone. And I absolutely hated speaking on the phone from as early as then. Because um, it was just a disembodied voice. Um, and I had no point of reference for whether what I was saying was boring the person or if they were smiling or interested, just, yeah, hated the phone. Um, I started drinking in my mid-teens purely out of peer pressure um, to appear cool. Um, I also smoked my first cigarette around this time too for similar reasons. By the time I got to uni, wine and cigarettes had pretty much become my primary diet uh, of coping. This... Lack of confidence around being able to be socially spontaneous that kind of emerged as my teens went on. I talked about my ADHD and autism kind of ebbing and flowing. The ADHD pushes you to seek new experiences and meet new people, but the autism hates lack of predictability. And look, being an awkward teenager 
it's just a teenager thing, obviously, regardless of neurotype. But I do think the challenges of being ADHD and having the ADHD desire to interact with lots of people, but the autistic challenge of actually doing it and hitting overwhelm, I think it's quite a unique challenge that needs more space to be talked about, particularly for ADHD teens going forward as we start to understand all this stuff better. Anyway, not knowing I had either condition at the time, having both of them fighting in my brain absolutely battered my confidence with girls and being able to just have conversations or flirt, let alone have any confidence to know how to do anything else. Um, I mentioned in my early teens being really passive and agreeing to go out with girls who asked me, then just freezing up and not knowing what to say. One of the very few times I was actually proactive in my mid-teens. I had this huge crush on an Italian girl in the year above me and asked her out with this massively, ridiculously over-rehearsed speech that I'd worked on and in my head was erudite and funny and sophisticated and hilarious and sexy. And I went up to her and said it all and her and her friends just laughed in my face and off I crawled to hide from the world again. Want the world, act on the world, get kicked by the world, disengage, hide, lather, rinse, repeat, the the ODHD cycle. Uh, but yeah, ver various early teenage girlfriends, none of which lasted or went anywhere. Um, I mentioned previously in one of my videos that the girls in my year kind of started taking the piss out of me for mouthing things or whispering things or practicing saying things before I said them out loud. So yeah, again, it became just rarely interacting with the external world and preferring my own internal world. And whenever I kind of poked my head out and tried to engage with the world, it was just a bit bewildering and seemed kind of cruel and mean. Um, comic books and graphic novels were broadly seen by peers, at least in the 90s, as childish distractions. But I was getting into, uh, into writers like Frank Miller and Alan Moore and Chris Claremont that were writing allegorically about the state of the world and psychological struggles and societal inequality. And it, it was very likely a kind of cocky, arrogant viewpoint or a defense mechanism for being rejected by my peers. But I just, I just felt like most of the other kids at my school and most of the teachers too were kind of a bit boring and uninteresting and there were bigger ideas and conversations happening elsewhere in the world. But my only access to those bigger ideas and conversations was through my comics and the, the letters pages with other fans discussing them. I used to love the, the letters pages Uh, and the debates other readers would, would have with each other in them. They were, they were pre-internet discussion boards, basically. Um, those were where the interesting discussions about things of substance were happening, at least in, in my head. Not in Edinburgh, and, and certainly not in my school. I think, this is, I think this is where my lifelong fascination with America started, because most of the comics I was reading were US comics. It felt like America was where the real people lived, who thought and wrote and drew about more interesting things and, and what the world could be rather than what it was. Um, anyway, I'm off topic a bit and going really long again uh, already. The, uh, the defense mechanism thing. Um, I definitely was seen as not cool as my teens went on. Um, the main friend group for a few years I had, um, had been really into tabletop gaming and painting miniature models, which I was into uh, as well. But then, as we got into later teens, they started getting more into drinking and experimenting more with drugs and going more and more to pubs, which I always felt really nervous about going underage because it was, it was breaking the rules. Um, I've always been quite weirdly deferential about rules, uh, even when I wanted to break them, yet another autism versus ADHD conflict. Um, I got a fake ID for pubs like everyone else, but I, I hated it and always felt like I was about to be found out and, and get into trouble. I kind of realised I wasn't cool and then I later tried to counter that by affecting this kind of ridiculous wine drinking, poetry writing, long coat wearing 
Muppet persona, which thankfully didn't last very long. Um, as I became a kind of older teen, I drifted away from that friend group and got my first kind of serious girlfriend, um, the magical, random, enticing, very odd exchange student who was completely, completely different to anyone I'd ever met before and uh, was, I think, the first of four times I felt in love with someone um, or completely infatuated anyway. Um, I'm not going to get massively into sex and intimacy in these videos. There's, there's other content creators who talk about autism and sex. I would, I would just say, <clears throat> I think ODHD and intimacy is a particularly challenging double-edged sword where one part of you wants all the experiences imaginable and the other part of you freaks out a bit with touch and noise. That can be a tricky and confusing tightrope to walk when you're already a teenager whose hormones and sense of self is, is all over the shop. And it's, it's probably in situations like these where I do wish I'd known I was neurodivergent back then to kind of give myself a framework for why everything felt weird and overwhelming and amazing and vulnerable and exquisite and terrifying all at once. There's being a teenager and negotiating this new terrain and there's being an undiagnosed neurodivergent teenager and negotiating this new terrain. And I don't think it's going out on too much of a limb to say the introduction to love and sex and intimacy is probably a considerable degree more challenging for those of us with slightly different brain wiring than it is for teenagers with neurotypical brain wiring. Want the world act on the world, get kicked by the world, disengage, hide, lather, rinse, repeat the ODHD cycle. So circumstances, neurotypes, lack of emotional maturity and a whole host of psychological baggage on both sides, known and unknown, conspired against us. Um, what must shall be. Teenage girlfriend went home and at the end of school I ended up taking a gap year to America uh, South Carolina, partly because I couldn't decide what I wanted to do about going to university and the opportunity came up to delay making a decision about my future, so I did. Um, this was another marker um, my psychiatrist identified as, as co-occurring ADHD and one of the things that prompted her to give me a formal referral for an ADHD assessment. She thought it was very unusual that autism alone would be keen to just impulsively go on a gap year to a high school in a foreign country on my own, but I was keen and I did go. Um, I felt very nervous about starting school in South Carolina, but also not. I felt, after going through the ringer a bit with Scottish school, first relationship, not really knowing what I wanted for myself next, I could basically forge a bit of a new identity in America, which I always idealized, like I said, um, as the as the interesting foreign kid myself, and, and everything would somehow magically fall into place for me as the center of attention, the the cool poetry writing kid, the, the Jim Morrison of Spartanburg, South Carolina, that no one really knew his background, and that was okay. Um, this was just the first of many run away and start agains for me uh, over the years when things felt overwhelming. But the the gap year predictably went pear-shaped very quickly. Um, my host family clearly thought I was weird and introverted and wasn't, I don't know, entertaining them as much as they wanted. I basically didn't want to interact with them at all. They were a means to an end to let me live a different life. Um, I made some friends, uh, some of whom I'm still in touch with to this day, but I missed my girlfriend and I missed my parents and I missed Scotland and I just missed things being familiar. Um, ADHD extroverted sensory seeking, get overwhelmed, autistic retreat into introversion, as I won't belabor the point, the, the lather, rinse, repeat. I, I just became more and more introverted and I shut myself away in my room just listening to music and completely retreated into myself. I was just like a shell. I was really unhappy. Um, I went for walks on my own by the side of the freeway with 
vehicles hurtling past and would would buy my own dinners at the nearest gas station just kind of just kind of depressed repetitious behavior that was not the american experience i was anticipating i basically had what i can now see in retrospect was probably my first major autism burnout i called home i said i wanted to end my exchange program early after a few months and just come back to scotland uh, in the in the weeks that it took to get arrangements in place and for the exchange program to try and talk me out of jacking it in, I kind of retreated even further into books and poetry and got really into like Yeats and Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost. Uh, I was also reading stuff like Lost Worlds by Eric von Daniken and uh, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. And I started writing a book of my own that in my head would encompass and explain absolutely everything about the world. It's that kind of categorizing. Um, it was called One False Perspective. Um, partly to help me kind of understand the overwhelm I was uh, increasingly feeling with everything. And um, that book idea kind of morphed into a weird movie script um, about aliens, then kind of a, a positive utopia sci-fi film where an alien invasion was faked to create world peace. And then I just kind of dropped it when my return flights got booked. The first of many ADHD creative ideas um, started and then dropped just as quickly uh, over the years. Anyway, it was a it was a massive anticlimax um, coming home early from the gap year. I had nothing to do. My school friends had mainly all started uni early, and I basically had a six month burnout recovery at home. Although I didn't know that's what happened at the time. I just felt I just felt overwhelmingly sad and exhausted and felt kind of incapable of doing anything to recover and, and pull myself out of it. It was a it was a cycle that had become all too familiar, um, but I only recognised for what it was after uh, getting my two diagnoses of ASD and ADHD more recently. The id repeat again, but I think it's it's worth doing the the ADHD novelty seeking it kind of puts you into a broader range of situations than just ASD, which forces you to learn to mask more convincingly in a broader range of situations and become in some ways more adept and adaptable at it. The, the ADHD doesn't so much mask and disguise the autism, as some have put it, but each, I think, learns to exist in the other's shadow and occasionally emerges to take more of what they would take if they existed as a soul diagnosis, if that makes sense. And this this automatic behavior feeds one condition but completely gives the other that's not in the ascendancy at that particular moment a kicking. And my ADHD had wanted to go on a gap year and by doing so had given my autism an absolute kicking which resulted in giving me what I would 100% classify looking back as, as my first major autism burnout. I was suddenly not having my overseas adventure anymore. I was back living with my parents. I didn't go out much and I kind of just kicked around quietly until it was time to, to start university. Friends would try to get me to go out and go to pubs and clubs and on the pool for girls with them, but as much as I wanted to talk to girls and have that confidence that my friends had, not mind getting turned down or snubbed. I would just feel these invisible ropes binding me and rendering me incapable of speaking to new people. And I just want to go home and friends would get really frustrated with me and basically stop asking me to, to come out with them. So the final big change of my teens, off to St Andrews University and moving out of home for the second time, I think I kind of geared myself up to try to start again, to try to start again, again, and be that kind of version of me that my ADHD side wanted to be, the the life and soul of the party. Um, freshers week, drinking wine, masking like hell, being one of the crowd. I, can, I kind of fell a bit in love with someone for the second time, again with a kind of magical, damaged girl with all sorts of weird childhood trauma. Um, she felt, I think, like a bit of a kindred, damaged soul that I wanted to kind of protect from the world and for her to look after me 
too. But once again, I just didn't know how to act. And this this really strong friendship that we initially forged kind of got a bit weird, at least on my part. And I basically got jealous of her having other friends and she kind of dropped me and drifted away. And I was utterly distraught and then wanted to leave uni because in my mind I'd fucked up and got things wrong yet again. Again, ADHD party animal, super sociable, got overwhelmed, autistic introvert came back curled me up into an inconsolable ball who never wanted to leave his dorm room other than to go and drink alone on the beach in the middle of the night. I said I said in my last video I was basically a happy kid. Um, I was I was a deeply unhappy teen though. Um, who isn't, I guess, right? But undiagnosed ODHD definitely played a part in how things unfolded with me, looking back. Um... Academically, at uni, um, so I'd always put schoolwork and revising for exams off and off and off until the night before essays were due, particularly when it felt like the, the work needed significant thought that I needed to align an order in my head first before even attempting it. I got through school doing this and got decent-ish, if inconsistent, exam results. But that approach really started to cause problems at uni, where they had a system of extensions for essays where you'd, you'd lose points for each day it was late until about a week beyond the due date where you'd fail. I just started default waiting to even start work until the night before the final extension deadline because that's what had been deemed okay. Um, and I would routinely get really good grades for pulling something together in one coffee-fueled overnight session a week after it was due, but automatically lose seven marks for lateness every single time. I didn't care about the marks really, I just wanted to wait until I felt I was ready to write the best essay I could possibly write about the subject in hand. I'd formulate ideas in my head for days, but just think I had more time to formulate better ideas even when it was late. Um, this was, I would later learn, a mixture of autistic inertia and ADHD needing last minute adrenaline to replace dopamine motivation deficiencies, but I had no idea about any of that back then. Um, it actually got worse, not better, because one of my tutors said I reminded her of the, the bright, crazy students she went to Oxford with in the 60s who had great ideas but could never do the coursework on time. Uh, and I liked that. I liked tutors thinking I was underachieving because they were telling me I had potential, but doing so in a positive way rather than a frustrated way like school teachers had always done previously. Having potential to be a great student in my weird head was better than just achieving the best marks now, even though I was getting those good grades and then losing them all because of lateness. I don't really know why I found that lost, frustrating, bright kid narrative so comfortable for me. It just, it just, it created less pressure, I guess, because the expectation on me became being one of the best students without having to actually be the best student. I think all the lateness and lack of executive function might also actually have been a bit of a cry for intervention or help somehow, because I knew I was struggling badly to initiate my tasks, even if I didn't know why. I definitely knew there was something a bit up with me that wasn't normal by the time I was at university, but the only narrative I had to explain it was the one that school teachers had always imparted on me, and I started really beating myself up for just being chronically lazy and getting really frustrated with myself for not living up to my potential. I, I was both pleased with myself for frustrating my tutors and also massively frustrated with myself for the exact same reason. I, I couldn't work myself out, and I hated it. Um, I persisted at uni. I didn't quit and drop out at least yet, and, and coasted by as a broadly very average student with the occasional inspired spurts of very good grades when the, the mood took me. Um, in my third year I decided no more lateness, S is always in on time. Um, I was briefly on course for a first in English Lit, but I couldn't sustain it and fell back into old habits and procrastination and dropping marks um, soon enough. I formed I formed a couple of nice friendships in this latter bit of uni, generally, generally with girls whom I broadly seemed to get on better with and kind of determined not 
to let myself feel attracted to anyone anymore because I always seem to fuck up female friendships and by wanting to make them more than friendships and always getting it wrong somehow. And so my mission with friendships became keep it platonic at all costs. And I was basically friend zoning myself on purpose over and over again and then getting hugely frustrated with myself that I couldn't get a girlfriend when I was basically blocking myself on purpose from, from doing so. Towards the towards the end of uni, I just became really miserable, depressed, and um, spent all my overdraft on CDs and wrestling videos, and become becoming mega mega introverted. Uh, rarely even leaving my room for for lectures. I got described as a bit Jekyll and Hyde for the first time, and uh, not not the last, um, not the last time by a girl who liked me around about this time. We'd been chatting in a tutorial and amusing each other and getting on well, but then she asked me for a drink and things started happening and of course I just instantly everything got mega awkward and things fizzled out after a few weeks as as usual. Um, I remember one night after lots of wine wading into the sea off the coast and just screaming at the top of my lungs over the waves and frustration with myself and my inability to be the person I wanted to be, either socially or academically. And I kept walking out and out into the sea until I was like choking on the salt water. And it wasn't long after this, I had what I would now identify as my second major autism burnout. And I dropped out of university. I was um, incapable of telling any grown ups that I was basically having an emotional breakdown. And so I made up this narrative to both my uni professors and my parents that I wanted to go to film school in New York um, and it was imperative I left my studies as I needed adequate time to prepare and submit a portfolio. It was it was nonsense. Uh, I left my studies as... I was just, I was just in burnout and I couldn't carry on with my studies but I, I felt like I needed a plausible cover story to explain why I was stacking it so spectacularly now having got through three or four years. Um, my professors and my parents were all really disappointed in me and understandably told me I was letting myself down. But despite all the kind of guilt and shame of having had all this opportunity and privilege handed to me and wasted it, I'd, I'd made up my mind and that was that. I was dropping out of university, having wasted everyone's time, the end. Um, but this being an ODHD story, um, there's of course always yet another rinse and repeat to any lather. So I wasn't going to film school in America, obviously, but my grandmother had died a few years earlier and left me a wee bit of money, not much, but enough to fly back to America and take a bit of a road trip around it, the magical place I was convinced I was supposed to be. And so to the, the frustration of my parents, I decided to just go traveling around the US um, no aim, just see what happens, another new start, be some kind of romantic, poetic, intellectual drifter. Again, convinced some sort of path would just present itself for me to follow. I'd been reading around this time like Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and decided I was going to go greyhounding and Amtracking like a slappable middle-class beat poet, see every state, observe and reflect and write the great American novel. Um, didn't matter, I wasn't American. Um, and yeah, that ended that ended my teens uh, with another new plan for another new start to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat and depression. So, God, tune in next week for my two stories um, of my ODHD 20s. Um, do you think Struan wrote the great American novel or do you think his sensory seeking ADHD set his autism up for a massive ego destroying kicking yet again? Join me next week for a probably very unsurprising next instalment of my, uh, what's actually turning out to be quite a bleak, depressing and self-indulgent story. Uh, sorry. Cheerio.